Welcome everyone to episode 16 of Managed to Win podcast. Today we have Jim Mustick. He's the author of 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die. I have the book right here. It's really great. It's so much fun to look through. I heard Jim, I got to give a shout out. Uh, I heard Jim on the Art of Manliness podcast with Brett McKay. And it was super fun to listen to you talk to him, talk about the books. I thought we could share you with our audience. And and we've talked a little bit about uh, some books that, that uh, talked about the idea of some books that might be really good for business people and leaders. And uh, Jim, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here with you and Dave. Uh, I'm glad you reached out to me. And I'm intrigued about how you made the, the jump from my talking about books and reading with Brett to manage to win. I mean, I, I know there are connections, but I'm just interested in what made you make that connection. It was more of a personal connection for me it, uh, because this year I've finally put together a list of books I want to read this year. And it's, uh-huh. I started with a minimum of, of 25. Last year I read 12 books. But it was kind of just off the shelf. That's the way I've been living my life, just as you describe, actually, in, in, in a couple of snippets I've seen of you. People read uh, kind of by chance, just, oh, that looks good, I'm going to read that, or that looks good, I'm going to read that. And there was a post, actually, and I hate to go back, but uh, actually, I'm happy to go back to Art of Manliness again. He had a post, he said, why you need a reading list, kind of like a uh-huh. reading plan. And yep. I thought that was really cool. So this this year I made a reading plan and then I saw your uh, episode. I was like, that's perfect. I need to I need to listen to that. This is great. Good. And um and it struck me that you would probably have some some good insight and, and maybe some really good recommendations, not only for us, but also for our listeners on what they might really appreciate in in a book for business leaders, people who are trying to run a company, manage people, or just uh, get a better grip on on where they are in life and why they're doing what they're doing. Well, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that, and I appreciate it. And I think you're right. Having been uh, an entrepreneur myself uh, for a couple of decades running my own company, and then I worked uh, for Barnes & Noble, a Fortune 500 company, for seven or eight years. I was a VP there. I've had an experience, uh, in addition to the reading, uh, that um, leads me to believe that, that your insight that this might be helpful to people is probably correct. Because one of the things we all, especially for entrepreneurs, um, but for everybody in business, we can easily tend to neglect the larger aspects of our own our own lives as we're focused in on our work or the project or the deadline uh, or the budget, whatever it may be. As, As you're saying, it's it's nice to have that shelf of books, which is. It's reaching outside ourselves to get back into ourselves in a way and to communicate with aspects of ourselves that in the busyness of our days, we often neglect. Yeah. It, Jim, you're opening up avenues here that, that in my mind, you know, just blowing apart my script that I had here perfectly. I was going to ask you a bunch of questions about. about well, go books. ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I didn't mean to, I've been an interviewer as well and I know what it's like to, have spent time preparing something and then your uh, 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 rambunctious guest goes off in a different direction. So I'll leave it to you to proceed. No, no, I was, I, it was a, it was a compliment. I was saying, I was about to say, this is, this is great. Now I, now I don't know where to go. I really want to ask you all <laughs> sorts of questions. We'll stick to the script though. And then, and then we can, okay. we can go off on, on any tangent we find, uh, find interesting. Good. Um, you just spoke though about how uh, you know a lot of your life has been in the book industry, and, and right. uh, I, I guess the next topic I wanted, I wanted to touch on was just talk about you wrote this book, one thousand books to read before you die. I guess if you could give a primer as to how you how that you know how you, you came to write the book, and kind of you just touched on your background. Could you go into that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, I had my first job in the book business in the early 1980s in an independent bookstore in suburban New York outside the city uh, for the, uh, I remember, because I still have the first pay stub, the princely slum sum of $2.70 an hour back then. Oh, big money. Uh, and, uh, well, we got a generous employee discount. So, uh, you know, I, I spent the little that I made in the store. Uh, But some years after that, I did a few different things. And then in 1986, 
I founded a book catalog called A Common Reader, uh, which was a way to sell books and to write about them. So I would write about books very personally. So it was like a book blog. And we eventually grew over 20 years to have about a quarter of a million subscribers around the country who'd get our catalog every three weeks and order books from us. So it was a kind of social community in books. So blog and social community, but nobody had invented the internet yet. <laughs> so we did it the old fashioned way through a catalog in the mail. Uh, and, um, but that was a, a great experience. The internet came in towards the end of that. But I wrote about books a lot for those 20 years. And part of the fun of it was the exchange with readers because readers would um, be great fans of our catalog and the way we wrote about books. And then they would write to us with suggestions about books that they uh, had discovered that we weren't talking about. And my wife and I still have six or eight file cabinets in the basement that are filled with letters from these readers, letters and then emails saying, you know, do you know about this author or do you know this book? Or I saw this in the catalog. Um, and so that kind of exchange um, of people's own advocacy and enthusiasm for books is really uh, part of the fun for me. So with my book, while it sounds very prescriptive, it's really meant to be an invitation to that kind of discussion. Because through books, uh, books become kind of talismans or souvenirs of aspects of our lives that, that uh, in memory and by inclination or vocation are important to us. So people love talking about them. So I did that. Uh, and as that was coming to a close, Peter Workman, who was a visionary publisher, the founder of Workman Publishing, who published the thousand books, uh, had published a book uh, around that time, I think it was in 2003, called The Thousand Places to See Before You Die by Patricia Schultz. And that was very successful, remains successful today. And one night when we were having dinner, he said, uh, you know, I'd love to do a book like that about books. Would you like to write it? Because he was familiar with the catalog. And I said, yes, I'd love to write it. Not quite uh, cottoning to what was uh, all of what, what would follow from that. And then I spent 14 years writing the book. So uh, <sighs> during that time, I was working for, for Barnes & Noble for part of it and so on. But it, was, it turned into a, a large project. Um, You've seen the book. It's a thousand pages long, so there's a lot of writing. It covers uh, books chronologically from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the first really recorded human story that was encoded on tablets 4,000 years ago in Babylon. It goes all the way up to uh, the most recent book in it was published in 2017. It's a book called Life in Code, A Personal History of Technology by Ellen Ullman, and everything in between. <laughs> It's got so much. And I, I think it even mentions, does it, I, you have kind of honorable mentions after each book entry. So it must, it, it mentions more than a thousand books, right? Oh, yes. It mentions uh, almost 6,000 books because I write an essay about each of the thousand books. And then at the end of each essay, there are end notes in which um, I have other books by the same author, uh, other books on the same subject or perhaps a biography of the author uh, whose book I've written about, and then other books to try if you like that one. So, so there's plenty of books to keep busy. You know, I hope uh, everyone who buys it uh, is gifted with a very long life <laughs> to, <Yeah. laughs> to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not surprised it took 14 years to put it together because it is very comprehensive. Yeah. And I, I love how you talk about books as kind of a, a, it sounds like you were saying it's a piece of our identity. It's a, a big... Yeah. Uh, very important thing to us, and one of the one of the the, the first book uh, that I mentioned to you in an email that when I opened the book up and I looked and it was uh, Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey, and that was very special to me because it was given to me as a gift by an uncle years ago, and I held on to that book even through one uh, tough time in my life when I purged a lot of books. Mm -hmm. It was one of the few books I held on to because it was important to me because it was a gift. And then I eventually read it and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was, I just, I, that was, made it really easy to love your book when I opened it up. 
terrific. I, well, good. I got off on the on the right foot with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. And and I had so much fun looking through. Uh, not only does you know seeing Desert Solitaire, I'm sure people go through your list and and see all the books that they love and enjoy. I, I saw Sherlock Holmes. I've read all the stories of Sherlock Holmes. I have the full volumes. Uh, Endgame by Orson Scott Card, um, which I love his sequel, Speaker for the Dead. And there's a couple other ones after that. And then my favorite, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's books, uh, Lord yeah. of the Rings. I've, I've yeah. a number of times I've read those. I was curious, do you, do you have uh, a few favorites in there that you're really fond of? Well, it changes uh, depending upon... Uh, the mood I'm in or the time of my life, but so, you know, I, I, I like them all enough to have included them. Right. But particular favorites are um, uh, this is a, it, it, the one I've been thinking about a lot recently. It's a, it's a book. It's ostensibly for kids, about 12 year olds. Um, and it's written by a man named Russell Hoban, who was uh, famous for, on both ends of the literary spectrum. He wrote a series of books, a picture books for kids about a badger named Francis. It was bread and jam for Francis, best friends for Francis, uh, a birthday for Francis. And those are charming books. They're still around. And then he wrote these kind of visionary novels for adults, kind of science fiction-y, the most famous of which is Ridley Walker. But the book that is special to me is called the Mouse and His Child. And it was written, you know, it's a full-length novel, but it's written for about 12 years old. It's about a, 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 a toy, a wind-up toy. There's a father mouse and a child mouse, and when it's wound up, the uh, father lifts the child up and it dances around in a circle. And the book starts out, they're very happily living in the comfortable toy shop with all their toy friends. They get sold into uh, a family. Then they get discarded and they have all of these harrowing experiences in junkyards and so on. And uh, it, it, it's thrilling and scary. It has a happy ending, but it really says so much about uh, life and, and how we navigate it and how we have to learn to be more resourceful, whether it's in uh, family situations or in business and to grow. Uh, you know, how do these, these mice these toy mice learn to become more than they were. And it's a, it's a really inspiring story. So I love that one. Um, and that was called a, a mouse and his child, the, the mouse and his child by Russell Hoban. That's great. And another, another one um, is the, the British 19th century novel Middlemarch by George Eliot, which I read in college when I was 19 years old. And it's, it's a story about a whole town and, and people who are, um, it's, the, the focus is a young woman named Dorothea Brooke, but there's other characters, there's a doctor and other figures. And they're all trying to figure out how to navigate with the, the outside world. And because as George Eliot writes, uh, so much of what we are are shaped by things outside of outside us and how do we navigate that and maintain our principles or our purposes or our inspirations and i remember when i read it when i was 19 i thought it was the wisest thing i'd ever read so i tend to read it once a decade so i've read it five or six times now uh to see if it holds up or if i hold up you know and every time i do um it uh, seems to get wiser and wiser so the more life experience i have the richer the book is. So I recommend that. It can be, um, it's a long book. It's one of those, you know, 700 page Victorian novels, but there's a terrific audio book read by Juliet Stevenson. So if anybody wants to sample it, it requires a little less patience than, than reading, uh, finding the time to sit and read because you can listen when you're driving or walking and so on. So that's, that's another one. Those are sometimes the best books I've found. The ones that just, it, it, it can be a slog at times, but you keep reading just because you know it's, it's so good. It it's offers so much to you. Yeah, yeah. But, some, but sometimes it doesn't, sometimes the pages don't matter. It's like you read Team right. Rivals, which I'm trying to get to, and that was really long. It didn't matter. One of my favorite books was um, uh, uh, Theodore Rex. Oh, Theodore great Rex. book. Yes. I, I mean, I couldn't put that thing down. 
I, I mean, I love that book. And it was, I don't know how many pages, you know, Jim, maybe, maybe, you know, 500 pages, I think at least. Yes. And, uh, but it was phenomenal. And then I bought the, the other one um, uh, that was before his presidency, the Theodore Rex, if I'm remembering correctly, was the eight years of his presidency. Right. And the other one, I think, is The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, uh, sounds right. I, I, yeah. I've got it back here somewhere. <laughs> so many books there's, behind you. There's Theodore Rex. Yeah, The Rise. Of, yeah, it's right next to it. The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and actually, I have the rise of Theodore Roosevelt in my book. It's in the thousand books, so you can read about it there. But I, uh, th there are certain books that strike us uh, at the right point in our lives where we can't get enough of them. And the more immersive yeah. they are, the more rewarding they are. But that's the thing about reading. I say in my introduction, um, when we think of reading in the abstract, it's a, it's a you know, we get a kind of, aura of homework about it but the way we really read is to me we read the way we eat and so some days we want you know a square meal with you know meat and veg and starch and some days we just want a hot dog and our appetite varies uh for reading the same way it does for uh for food and uh and we different kinds of of food and books can delight us at different times well, well, what did you say earlier, uh, or Jeff was quoting you about your books are kind of, um, you didn't use the word identity, but you know, kind of. I, books are key to our, our, our self-identity. Uh, they, they speak to us. It's, you know, what struck me, Jim, from there, you may remember, because you and I date back lo more than Jeff. Yeah. It was a movie like 25 years ago or more. I think it was with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes, the the twenty five percent solution. Okay. Uh, yes. Remember that. So so he had a cocaine addiction, and Doctor Watson tricked him into meeting with Sigmund Freud. Right. And if you recall in the movie, he is ushered into Freud's office. You know, thirty seconds or whatever before Freud shows up, and then when Freud comes in, he doesn't introduce himself. He says, "Do you know who I am?" And he says, yes. And, and then Holmes then tells him who he is in part because he's observed all the books on his bookcase <laughs> and the certifications and everything else and basically tells him who he is. And I, and I see the books on your case would tell me a lot. And also you've interspersed the family photos, um, you know, what's important to you and what you want to keep. I mean, you've read thousands of books these are the ones that you keep i mean yep. it's probably there's a story behind each one of those as yes. to why you chose those that you're on your shelf whereas the other ones are you know somewhere else you know a, a bookshelf can really be a tangible autobiography and you can follow it along uh and really map your life out i, I once uh um had a, a project where i would ask authors to uh, tell your life story in 10 books. So, you know, you could start with Good Night Moon and go all the way up to what you're reading now. Uh, and it's a fun exercise. It's fun to do it, you know, yourself. Uh, and you could do it kind of chronologically with your life. And uh, you, you really, books can prompt such uh, rich thoughts of your own or articulate things you've never quite been able to say yourself, but you recognize once you see somebody else say them, that, um, that, that it, that does have that value. So uh, I'm always a little bit, again, I, it's important sign of age, but if I go into someone's apartment or house and there's no books on display, I'm a little lost. You know, I like to see, because just as you said, with the Holmes and Freud, you can kind of say, okay, I, you know, this is kind of who this person is. So, so Jim, we talked about uh, you might have some ideas about the the books that you think you know business people, leadership, uh, character, managing others. Some some books that might speak to those topics that you think would be really important for uh, our, our audience to listen to. Share with us what 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 you think would be good. Well, one that uh, I'm particularly fond of. Uh, it's not in my book. But um, on this subject, it's this book here. It's called Obliquity by John Kay, 
who is a, uh, the subtitle is, Why Our Goals Are Best Achieved Indirectly. And he's an economist. He's a columnist for the Financial Times. He teaches or has taught in the past at the London School of Economics. And his um, idea is that we are always focused on mapping out exactly how we're going to get from one point to the next. But generally in life, most of our decisions or directions are not determined that way because there's so much going on. And uh, he, this book is really an encouragement to embrace that kind of indirection uh, so that we are open to the experiences around us, the people around us. We all know that if we're working uh, with teams or uh, in a business environment, things are changing all the time. And you can have the best project plan in the world, but it's not always going to track with reality and new things are going to come up. And so that the more that we can be open to um, sorting our experience uh, as it comes in while having some principles in mind or some purposes, the more successful we're going to be. Uh, he quotes at the, at the beginning of, of his book, it's an epigraph actually on page one, John Kay quotes a passage from Jim Collins' book, Built to Last, where Collins talk, talks about how uh, visionary companies in the long run and generally end up making more money than those who are focused just on profit all the time uh, or only on the profit rather than having a, a more animating vision. So uh, that's another approach to the same thing. And I think uh, this is a great book that I, that I highly recommend, Obliquity by John Kay. And on the theme, if I may, what, part of what I'd like to share with your audience about reading, again, is oblique. We don't always learn the most about uh, what we need to know by going at it directly. So we can learn a lot about our uh, business lives or about how to lead or how to interact with others through books that have nothing to do particularly um, with that subject. Uh, the, the single most important sentence in terms of, of work, or it is actually applicable to all life uh, that I've ever read, uh, I came upon reading an obscure collection of literary essays by a man named Hugh Kenner. And Hugh Kenner had been a student of Marshall McLuhan, who was the great media theorist in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and in this collection of essays, uh, Kenner wrote an obituary for his former teacher. And in that obituary, there's this sentence, which, which I love. What you're taking for granted is always more important than whatever you have your mind fixed on. And I think in most settings, it's been true for me in writing, in product design and development, which is what I did for Barnes & Noble. Um, it's true in talking to my daughters and in family situations that we go into most situations taking a lot of things for granted that uh, we, we get fixed on aspects of the problem that are further down the pipeline and not examining what we take for granted and what's really important. And I think that's the kind of lesson you pick up in reading and you're reading around. I wasn't reading a book of literary essays because I thought I'd get management advice or leadership advice, but I actually did by picking up the sentence that stuck with me. And it's been true in, you know, I do work on school boards and in business and again in my writing career. And that kind of lesson has really stuck with me. Uh, as an example, I, when I started working on staff at Barnes & Noble, I was doing a lot of work in technology, which was not my background. Um, and I was working with people trying to design a book recommendation system. So I was talking to all these data scientists. And I was steeped in the books, but knew nothing about the science or the data or the information technology. So I invited them all into the New York office for a week. Many of them came from California. And I said, we're gonna sit in a room and I want you to tell me what you do and how you think about it. 
and what so I could see what they took for granted in trying to sort all this data. And then what was even more instructive was I said, okay, now I have to, I'm going to go out to Silicon Valley and sit with them. And I have to explain to them all the assumptions I have about this as a book person and how I think readers behave. And so after those two weeks, uh, we had a tremendously fruitful partnership because I understood where they were coming from. Uh, I understood where I was coming from and we were able to talk to each other in a different way. Again, by looking at first what each of us was taking for granted before we got down to the, to the design of a project, if, if that makes sense. Can you give me some examples of what people were taking for granted? Yes. Um, when you, you have a, um, someone coming into something like a book recommendation system, who's a, who's a book person from the book world, uh, you have a great sense of context that this book, there's other books by this author. This book is like that book. It sits on the shelf or in that part of the store. Readers who like this, like that book. And you want all of that knowledge to be somehow magically baked into whatever um, the data system is feeding back to you. On the other hand, the data scientists were just looking at discrete bits of data and seeing what the relationships are uh, by very tightly defined metadata. And so if you looked at it that way, you were going to get things that, according to the assumptions of the data scientists, all were grouped together. But according to the booksellers, wouldn't really make any sense. So in a real world example, if you go into a store and um, you ask, you've seen the movie or read the book um, Unbroken. Do you remember that movie? Uh, it was a yeah. World War II veteran. And so you go to a bookseller, I'd like another book like this. I loved reading this. And so the data or the available metadata might make available to you to recommend other books about World War II, other memoirs about World War II. And a bookseller uh, might say, well, the history's over there and the World War II books are on that shelf. But if you know the book, you know that the experience that the reader had with that book was, had more to do with the fact of it being a survival story and that there were survival stories in many different areas. So the World War II piece of it is one aspect of it, but it's probably not the most important. So you might, might recommend a different book about, um, uh, there's a great book, uh, and it's actually a great uh, example of leadership, uh, Endurance, about Ernest Shackleton uh, in the Antarctic. And that's a book that has something like the feel of, of, of that Unbroken might give to a reader. So what we ended up doing is, I got a group of booksellers, uh, we'd pick a book that was popular uh, or that was a known quantity to readers that people might come in and ask for. And we created constellations of books around that. Like, what books would you recommend if somebody said, I read Unbroken or I read Harry Potter or I read Team of Rivals? And booksellers would, you know, off the top of their heads, they'd be able to put together a group of 10 to 12 books. And then I'd go to the data scientists and say, let's take these books as a group and see what the data tells us instead of taking them as one piece at a time and adding them all up. And we got very rich recommendations that way. So that's a kind of long winded explanation of trying to, you know, the, the, the insight that we came to there was that if we created a group of books that we felt fit together, then the discrete metadata, filtered by that group would be uh, more on target than, than less so. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have any other books uh, that you wanted to share? Uh, yeah. Um, there's a book called Time and the Art of Living by Robert Gruden, uh, which is a book about time uh, and about how we think about time, time being the dimension of our lives. And he writes about it, uh, time philosophically speaking, but also 
time while you're waiting for a train and he brings it uh, into uh, real world situations. And the book is written in these short paragraphs um, that you can read like one a day. It's almost, you could treat it kind of like a intellectual devotional and just go through these, uh, these thoughts he has on time. And it's revelatory because it makes you recognize uh, how you're living and attending to or not attending to this most important aspect of, of the element in which we live of time. And it's, there's a passage in here, I'll read it to you because it had tremendous influence on me. It's a simple idea, but it's the kind of thing that uh, applies, again, individually, individually but also uh, in a work setting. setting. So this is Gruden. And you can, I think you can see here these little paragraphs, the way they're written. Yeah. So this is paragraph number 7.20. Every time we postpone some necessary event, whether we put off doing the dinner dishes till morning or defer an operation or some difficult labor or study, we do so with the implication that present time is more important than future time. For if we wish the future time, the future to be as free and comfortable as we wish the present to be, we would perform necessary actions as soon as they prove themselves necessary. There's nothing wrong with this as long as we know what we are doing. And as long as the present indeed holds some opportunity more important than the task we delay. But very often our decision to delay is less a free choice than a semi-conscious mechanism a conspiracy between our reasoning awareness and our native dislike of pain. The result of this conspiracy is a disconcerting contradiction of will. For when we delay something, we simultaneously admit its necessity and refuse to do it. Seen more extensively, habitual delays can clutter our lives, leave us in the annoying position of always having to do yesterday's chores. Disrespect for the future is a subtly poisonous disrespect for self and forces us paradoxically enough to live in the past. So, you know, in the simplest form, that's make your bed when you get up. <laughs> but right. in the philosophical way, it's, it, it, it's really important. And this stays with me every time I'm putting something off. And I used to, I had this typed up nicely on a piece of paper and I'd give it to uh uh, young people, particularly working for me when I had my own business and say, you know, this is a really important idea because you have so much opportunity, you know, here, you got to get things done, but also in your lives to be attending to how time is passing and how you might use it more, more wisely. Um, so this is a, this is a terrific book that I think, again, by um, helping managers to be more reflective and uh, and more, and to look at reading as an investment in themselves uh, can be very powerful, and that can extend to those around them. There's another wonderful book that I recommend to everyone who has to be productive called "Getting Things Done" by David Allen. Do you do you know that book? I feel like I've heard of yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I know it. Okay, and it's a terrific book. It's it's kind of on the same theme, but. If, if what I just read to you is kind of a, a grand strategy, David Allen is very tactical. He goes, this is how you handle this. This is how you manage your inbox. And it's all very intuitively. It's intuitive. It's kind of, yeah, I know I should be doing that, but it gives you a program to do it and to make you it conscious of, of, conscious of dealing with all of the incoming things you have because his main point is if – you don't have the things that are incoming uh, sorted out and feel in control of them. They're always occupying some place in the back of your mind uh, that's taking mental energy from more important tasks. So the simplest thing, uh, one of the things he recommends is have an inbox and make sure you get to the bottom of it at least once a week, because then your mind will feel free you know, I, I have this note called Jeff Russell. Uh, and if I throw it in the inbox, I'm not going to be 
reminding myself of it for the next six days. But I know once a week, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to put it on the list. And then the next day after that, I'll call them. So getting things done by David Allen, I recommend to, uh, to everyone uh, as well as a kind of practical application of that passage from Robert Gruden that I just read you. Yeah. And part of that is you schedule time to go through that inbox and clear it out. Yes. And you put and it being, in your calendar. Exactly. And knowing you're going to do that yeah. lets you throw it in there with impunity because we've all had, you know, it, it's like uh, the, the inbox where like you never get to the bottom of it. It has no outbox. So yeah. that's the, that's the key piece. He said, as long as you know, you're going to do it once a week, um, you, you're going to, it's going to be freeing and it's liberating that way. So that's, well, and I'm That's so glad you brought up that that thing from Gruden, that paragraph 720. I want to I want to look that up. I, I'm not familiar with the book, or maybe you can send me a snapshot of it. But yep. I want to incorporate that into our time management training. I mean, that's not one piece of the puzzle. There's a lot there. Yes. On the behaviors that are causing the procrastination. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's 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 a wonderful book. There's an um, an, another book, you, you mentioned Team of Rivals. There's another book of 19th century American history, which is, um, if, if, if someone likes to read about history, um, but that's filled with lessons. And that's a book called The Metaphysical Club by Louis Menand, M-E-N-A-N-D. And this is about, essentially about the the, the people who shaped the American philosophy of pragmatism, which is so important to uh, American life and culture and business. And it's about uh, William James, the philosopher and psychologist, about Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, the, the great Supreme Court justice, um, Charles Sanders Pierce, the mathematician, and John Dewey, the educator. And they were all in the uh, Friends uh, and this philosophy of pragmatism uh, came out of their friendship and and the world that they were living in. It's it's not a dry book at all. It's extremely readable. It's like Team of Rivals. It's brilliantly done. But there are things in there that just strike you, like Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, there's a sentence in there that's stuck with me. I underlined it, and I've never forgotten it. I read the book 20 years ago. He wrote, it is the merit of the common law, meaning the tradition of, of common law. It is the merit of the common law that it decides cases first and determines the principles afterwards. And that's a pretty good definition of pragmatism, that you're in a setting, in a business setting, you have to make a decision. Uh, you have kind of uh, unarticulated principles that are guiding you in making decisions. But it's okay to go ahead. That's what you're going to do anyway. You're going to try and solve the problem. And then you can go back and determine what the principles were, which can help you further on. But the whole concept of pragmatism and the explanation of how it uh, grew out of psychology and mathematics and education uh, is really rich. And it's a human story. It's told in a human way uh, that it has all kinds of applications to the workplace. I love how so many of these books that you are suggesting are um, focused on a deeper type of thinking about a problem or a situation or one's self. There are so many books in the business world I found that are how-to books. They're step-by-step, right. step, very specific, very surfacey in a way that walk us through a process and they don't dive into the, the deeper methods or thinking behind the process. Um, so just a thought. I, I pre yeah, I think that I think that's very true. And if 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 all the things we had to face in business uh, were as um, manageable by all these rules, uh, nobody would ever have any problems in the workplace because there's enough books that have been written telling us what to do. But they don't they don't really give us the kind of guidance. You know, all of leadership is really the the overlay of provisionality with um, the real world of what's uh, of the, so uh, sorry it's overlay of provisionality with some higher purpose and the job of a leader 
is to kind of keep the right like uh, dimension there in focus because things are going to happen that are going to throw out the rule book that you learned from reading this management book, but you know, you have some higher purpose. So your role is to, is to uh, overlay those two things and have the right thing in focus at the right time. There's a great, you know, there's a lot in, in, in many management books that are good. One of my favorite things in is in uh, good to great by Jim Collins. And this was a tremendous insight to me. I read first, he did a version for, for schools, for school leadership um, that was drawn from the book. And I've done a lot of volunteer work on school boards and so on. And the thing that I remember the most, and that was the most helpful in framing problems with my colleagues that I was working with, uh, he said, well, you have to make a to-do list for the institution. And the first thing on the to-do list is should be to make a stop doing list. <laughs> what should we stop doing? And again, it goes back to what are we taking for granted that we have to do that we haven't really thought about whether we really have to do them or not. Because you can only do so many things at a time. And in any complicated organization, in any human organization, you can have a to-do list that is endless. And so just the idea of the stop doing list where you could take a number of things and say, these aren't really critical. These are the critical ones was um, that was a, like a, a rubric from a, from a management book that has endless use to me. I mean, it's just, it's, it's brilliant. And I would, I would reword part of that, that um, it, to reinforce what you're saying <clears throat> in that, a lot of the managed books, managed books, books tell you what to think or what to do. And what you're, if I'm hearing you correctly, <clears throat> you're saying it's really important for leaders to understand how to think, how to connect that higher purpose that they've got with what they need to get done. And that's right. a thinking process versus saying, here it is, it's cookie cutter. And as you said, if it's cookie cutter, it's easy, man. You got the systems. There's plenty of books. You can, you can make those decisions. But that's not the way life works. Exactly. And if from, from a leadership position, can you internalize that lesson for yourself and then share it with the team you're managing? You know, you can always tell an inexperienced manager when, when you go in to meet with him or her and what you get as someone reporting to that person is a list of things from their to-do list. They're not giving you ownership of your own time and space. They're just saying, I have all this stuff to do here, Jim, you take some of it. And so they're not thinking, you know, they're not going through that process you were just describing of thinking about how to prioritize, prioritize and so on. And they're not giving their employees the benefit of exercising the same kind of, uh, it's not really control, but ownership with the responsibility that goes with that as well. And just knowing that when, you're, when, you're, when you have a, a report coming into you saying, what are we going to talk about now? Am I just going to, you know, I got these 10 things to do today and I'm only going to get to seven of them. Am I just going to give her three without a larger conversation around it? That's a really important lesson. So having those kind of frameworks is, it's, is valuable. Wow. I've never thought of it that way. Hmm. So that's because you're, you're working for an enlightened employer yourself. So you haven't, uh, yeah, the, the burden is not on me, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and then there, there are other things that, um, in reading where you just come upon snippets of it. Sometimes it's not the whole book, but there's, you know, in thinking about this, I, I used the Hugh Kenner quote before, but there's a, another marvelous quote from uh, Doris Lessing, who's a Nobel Prize winning British novelist, which I, when, when I have an office, uh, I always tack up on the wall. And it's, whatever you're meant to do, do it now. The conditions are always impossible. And it's just, you know, it always makes me feel good to read that because you, you, you know, you go into work, there's too much going on. Uh, there's, you know, someone has a personal issue. There's uh, a, a new demand from 
from up above in the food chain that you have to respond to. Uh, and to have those kind of touchstones that really can give us, like that quotation, is just absolutely marvelous. Uh, and it gives us the courage to move forward. There's another one from um, Neil Stevenson is a science fiction writer. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, The Confusion. And, and that book is a kind of, it's historical science fiction, if you will. It's about Isaac Newton and and so on. But there's one passage in there, a uh, character uh, says something that, again, is is very important. And this paragraph, I love the novel, but this paragraph has stuck with me as really useful knowledge. The character is talking to a young protege of hers. And she says, pay attention, that's all. Notice things, connect what you've noticed, connect it into a picture, think of how the picture might be changed and act to change it. Some of your acts may turn out to have been foolish, others will reward you in surprising ways. And in the meantime, simply by being active instead of passive, you have a kind of immunity that's hard to explain. Now, that's something I've felt in my own life, but I'd never been able to express until I read it. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, a large part of, of having the, uh, um, you could call it success or just the courage to follow your convictions is taking that first step and getting that forward motion. So reading gives us these touchstones, like scenes like that, where somebody expresses something that you've known to be true, you know, pick up the phone and make the call or go into the meeting and say this. And once you take that step, um, it may not turn out exactly a as uh, perfectly, but the forward motion is really important. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, Jim, I'm curious to uh, touch on a, a slightly different topic mm -hmm. around books. Um, you're stating very eloquently that that books are this collective knowledge and many and many times we find our innate feelings expressed through words of others that we did not know how to express ourselves mm -hmm. and those are incredibly value valuable they have inherent value i'm i'm curious how you see maybe this is a little bit of a tangent but i'm curious how you see the emergence of digital books and uh the the how that might affect for instance if everything goes digital in in you know 100 200 years i'm personally a little, a little bit worried that things in di the digital era could be changed so easily whereas mm -hmm. books a, print, a printed work is always going to hold that original writing that's never going to change i was curious just what you feel about that well there's there's um I think two dimensions to it. One is just practically speaking, uh, digital books allow uh, easy access for a lot of people to get books quickly, to get a broad range of books. Uh, in my experience, um, they're they're, it's terrific to have uh, uh, an e-reader and digital books if you're traveling because uh, I'm usually reading a few books at once, so it's nice to have one lightweight thing where they're all there. Um, and they're great for reading things that uh, are, are essentially stories that go from beginning to end. Because what you want from that experience, if it's a mystery or it could be a romance or a thriller, uh, you just want to know what happens next. You know? But if you're reading something like Team of Rivals, it's a different experience because in a book like that, you know, a name is going to be dropped that you're going to say, you know, I remember that person being mentioned earlier. And a funny thing that happens is your hand kind of remembers how far back it was and it'll pick up a pile, a bunch of pages and flip and you'll be pretty close to where it was. And you'll remember it was kind of on the left side of the page or the right side of the page and you'll find what that was. In a digital book, you can search, but that's not really as intuitive as it should be. And you lose that kind of embodiment of, of the experience of reading it. And you're kind of like in the middle of the ocean and ra rather than in sight of land and you can just flip back. So it's a different kind of experience and books, you know, like mine or a long book where you want to flip around in, uh, 
they're, they're not as, uh, the interaction isn't as satisfying. Um, but your point uh, about how does the record survive, you know, unchanged so that we know where things were, that's a very interesting question. You know, we are assuming um, as a culture that all these things that are turning digital are going to be easily accessible forever and that it's okay to digitize um, all of these archives. It certainly uh, has many benefits in making them searchable and available remotely and so on. But in 500 years, uh, is the, will the electric grid <laughs> still be robust enough to support all this? Where are all these servers going to live? How is this all going to work? And can the record in fact be changed, which is, is um, uh, of interest, not only in terms of literature and beautiful artifacts of, of the human mind, but also in terms of history and, and, uh, and fact and, and how do we have a record of what really happened? So I don't know what the what the answer to that is, uh, but I think there's a lot of thinking we need to do um, as a culture, uh, as an economy, uh, about what the digital future really means. Uh, there's a wonderful book now that I'm reading. It's a massive book called "The Age of Surveillance Capitalism" by a woman named Shoshana Zuboff. I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. She, she was, a, she's, I think she's a professor emerita at the Harvard business school. And she has done this fabulous job of integrating uh, economics, business theory and management theory, technology, uh, culture more broadly into looking at um, all of what's baked into the digital world now as it's taking shape the kind of uh, extraction of data from every aspect of our lives and how little we know about uh, how it's being used or that it's being used. At one point, she, she quotes studies, it's very well researched, that if you have a smart thermostat in your home, if you were to read through all the terms of use that are there and the dependent terms of use that go out to third parties, you'd have to read through a thousand contracts. Um, and she writes about this very smartly and very, very well. The book is a, oddly a pleasure to read just in its prose. And it just kind of opens your eyes. Uh, one, you're impressed with her learning and her diligence in assembling this, but it's worrisome about what, what exactly we are just kind of seeding without thinking of it, about it to, uh, to this kind of new world order of things that, uh, where the, the division of learning can be controlled by very few uh, players. Uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, I, I think it's very important to discuss uh, that in cir book circles, in any any circle of learning, you know, this, this, this town square of learning that, that involves so many different people and information. Um, and I, I like what you said and what you said about it, you know, it's, it's when it comes to the digital sphere versus the physical sphere, I, I actually want to share, uh, you've shared a number of patch, passages. I finished finally a blog post about team of rivals. Ah, you reminded me as I was looking for a quote, uh, from the book, a particular story, exactly right. The memory in my thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> Is that amazing? It's just, just, it was great. I found, I found it right away. And uh, it's this piece about uh, Lincoln and his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. And I'll share uh, the, one of my favorite paragraphs from the book was talking about Stanton. A clerk recalled finding Stanton one night in his office. The mother, wife, and children of a soldier who had been condemned to be shot as a deserter on their knees before him, pleading for the life of their loved one. He listened, standing in cold and austere silence, and at the end of the heartbreaking sobs and prayers, answered briefly that the man must die. 
The crushed and despairing little family left, and Mr. Stanton turned, apparently unmoved, and walked into his private room. The clerk thought Stanton an unfeeling tyrant until, until he discovered him moments later, leaning over his desk, his face buried in his hands and his heavy frame shaking with sobs. God help me to do my duty. God help me to do my duty, he was repeating in a low wail of anguish. Yeah. That is a passage that my thumbs found for me, and I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful for the physical book. Yeah, that's, it reminds me, there's a wonderful passage, one of the books I write about in the Thousand Books, uh, called The Longest Day by Cornelius Ryan, which is about the D-Day invasion. Um, and uh, there's a scene, it's described by, there's a uh, correspondent, I think it's from NBC, who is standing next to Eisenhower as he's watching the planes take off to go towards Normandy. And he just describes there's plane after plane after plane and General Eisenhower is standing there with tears rolling down his face as he's watching these planes take off, going to uh, recapture Europe. The same kind of human emotion. Um, so, th you know, those are the kinds of things that, that reading puts us in, in touch with mm -hmm. in uh, that it's hard to get. Um, and something about those emotions that are so deep that, we want to avoid at all costs in our own lives, but sharing them kind of increases our compassion and our generosity and our wisdom. Um, you know, that's why books are so important. There's a great, I just gave a talk last week. I was invited uh, by my high school alma mater in the Bronx, New York, to address the senior class. They have a senior alumni breakfast. Mm. And I use this quote from one of the books I read about in the book, called The Seven-Story Mountain by Thomas Merton. Now, Thomas Merton was a very interesting guy. This book was a, a, book, a bestseller in 1948. And he was a bohemian, bohemian uh, an intellectual at Columbia University, a terrific, terrifically gifted writer. But uh, he retreated from the world and became a Trappist monk in Kentucky. And paradoxically, uh, he wrote this book uh, while he was uh, in the cloister and it became a bestseller and he became world famous as a kind of social conscious, even though he was, uh, you know, a, a cloistered monk. But in any case, uh, there's a, here's a passage. Again, it's one of those uh, milestone passages for me. Uh, he writes, souls are like athletes that need opponents worthy of them if they are to be tried and extended and pushed to the full use of their powers and rewarded according to their capacity. And what's true of our souls is true of our hearts and minds. Um, it's reading can make us uh, push ourselves in directions that the kind of uh, pressures of the office might not get us to, but that we can bring that growth back to the office when we get back by experiencing, like you're reading about Stanton, uh, that we are kind of breaking through the, the blinkers that most of us have in our daily lives, that the press of business forces us to keep on. And the real, I think, key to being a leader and to helping those whom you are leading to grow is to be able to think beyond the immediate into a more richer kind of experience because the more you know enriched our lives are um, the more we can enrich the lives of others and make the work environment more productive for everyone as well as the broader environment in in outside the office yeah yeah that's powerful yeah. did you have any other books uh, on on your list that you wanted to share well there's there's about uh, 975 more <laughs> in the book. So, you know, we could go on forever, but I think generally, um, you know, I covered those, those uh, what immediately came to be as being most relevant to this kind of conversation. 
but the, my big you know advice is to take the time to read and you may read a you know a book about archaeology or you may read a book about um, a book of short stories and you're going to come upon something that uh, speaks to you or a part of yourself that the rest of your day isn't speaking to. And those are generally rich things worth, worth nurturing. And, you know, I would, I would say this. Reading nourishes the most important ongoing conversation that we have in our lives. And that's the conversation we have with ourselves in our own head every day. And the richer and more interesting you can make that conversation, the richer and more interesting the contributions you could make to your enterprise or to the people around you. So uh, there's a great quote from the uh, poet Randall Jarrell, where it, it's just six words, read at whim, read at whim. Now, I'm a big fan of that. You'll get a lot of benefit too by reading John Kay about uh, the oblique way we make decisions or Jim Collins about, about the, the stop doing list, but just the reading, um, giving yourself the benefit of a space to think outside the box that our days put us in is really valuable. That's powerful. Yeah. Dad, did you have any further questions for Jim before we wrap up? I've been biting my tongue because the last three points Jim has made, I'm just like, oh man, those are, those are so wise and, and so powerful points. That's a great ending spot. And now you did three in a row. It's like maybe the third one's a charm. I don't want to pull back, you know, open it up anymore because we might be here another hour. And I know Jim has <laughs> blessed us with this time. Jim, it has been fantastic having your insights. Well, uh, thank today. you. And, you know, you also run the risk that I'm going to say something really stupid if we keep going. <laughs> so we should, <laughs> I don't we should get the impression that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> we should stop while I, if, if I, if I hit three, I think that's good. But listen, I've really appreciated this. I've enjoyed it very much. And, uh, uh, you know, I hope, I hope some of your listeners will find some things. There's, there's so much in the book. Uh, it's half fiction. It's half nonfiction. There's books about just about any subject. But the big, you know, my big message is to take the time to invest in yourself and, and, um, and have the confidence that investing in kind of in the, to go to the places where your intuition leads you you're going to find some treasure there. That's great. It, the book is 1,000 Rooks Books to Read Before You Die. It is organized in a, a, a fantastic way. You even have little, uh, I noticed at the beginning, Jim, you have, you have little lists uh, that pertain to certain topics. I noticed one was 12 books to read before you're, you're 12. Was right. that, that, that one mm -hmm. of them? And there's a bunch of other ones there. There's a full index in the back and even a checklist you can, you can use to check off the books that you've read. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time. How can uh, people get in touch with you or learn more about the book? Oh, uh, I want to talk about your website as well. Yes, we have a website called 1000booksToread.com. Uh, that's 1000booksToread.com. You can go on the site. All of the books are listed with brief descriptions, not the full uh, entries that are in the book, but brief descriptions. And each book has three buttons. So you can agree that this is a book to read before you die. Uh, there's another button that says life's too short. You don't want to read it. <laughs> and then you can add it to a to be read list. You can comment on my choices and you can add a book of your own. So if you have a book that you think everybody should read before you die, you can add it into the mix. And at the website, you can sign up for a uh, newsletter that I do every two weeks where I talk about all this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, I think if, if you're a reader and you've found any of this interesting, you'll enjoy the website and enjoy the newsletter. So that's 1000booksToread.com, 1000. Great. Thank you so awesome. much, Jim. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.